Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting Great British Road Journey. This week I've come to Hampshire, a county that's quite good apparently. It looks nice enough, that's for sure, but it's also a very productive county, boasting some of the lowest unemployment figures in the country. And if you do work here, it's most likely a high-end technical job within the military or computing industry, so yeah, Hampshire's doing just fine. Today we'll be taking a journey across the northern part of the county, advancing from Andover and finishing in Farnborough. And as always, to help navigate our way around, we'll be using my 1923 Michelin guidebook, period correct maps, but mostly doing whatever I please. We begin in Andover, in the days of my guidebook, a small town with around eight and a half thousand residents. And it certainly would have been a busy place because Andover was Hampshire's centre of grain milling and wool processing. And over your money, and I'll give you some wool. And that's where it gets the name. And over here to the east of the town is this structure known as Ladies Walk Bridge. It was built in 1851, and it's located on a footpath that you could say is a very early abandoned road because it's on a pre-Roman track known as Mark Way. Sure, it was just a track, but at the time it would have been the main route for travellers. However, if you want to see a more modern example of an abandoned road, you've still come to the right place. You just need to look down. Ladies Walk Bridge takes you over what used to be the A303, the main road for Andover, which ran right through the middle of the town. In the 1950s and 1960s, it was decided to demolish most of Andover's original character and replace it with a horrible shopping center and general 1950s and 1960s redevelopment. With that came some new infrastructure by way of the Andover Bypass, a lovely dual carriageway that severed the old A303 road, meaning it could no longer be used as a road and the new dual carriageway took on the A303 number. My the guidebook suggests that when in Andover, leave Andover and head to Berry Hill, which is found to the south of the town in a place called Anna Valley. Anna Valley was home to Taskers of Andover, a metalworks and engineering firm that was set up in the year 1813. It's not important right now, but remember the name Taskers. As for the hill, it used to be home to an Iron Age hill fort, a fort built in the Iron Age on a hill. Today, it's a hill with a nice view. I didn't think about that because visiting the hill has put me in the wrong place for our journey, which requires the B3400 out of Andover. No bother though, a short drive across town and I'm back on track to head to our next destination, the village of Whitchurch. In the days of my guidebook, Whitchurch was a village or small town with only 2,300 residents. And the name Whitchurch is of Anglo-Saxon origin, meaning white church. And now we're all wondering, is there a white church in Whitchurch? No. At least not anymore. It's believed that the original church, made of chalk or limestone possibly, was replaced by a different building in the late 1100s. This was then remodelled in the 15th century and then completely replaced in 1866, giving us All Hallows Church, one of the oldest buildings in Whitchurch. It's definitely a church, but it's not Whit. In the centre of Whitchurch is Whitchurch Silt Mill, a water mill that was built in the year 1800. Fun fact for you, during the mid-1800s, nearly 40% of the workforce at the mill were children under the age of 13. It's not clear as to when child slave labour ended at the mill, but in the year 1866, the mill fell into the ownership of the Hyde family and they struck a deal with fashion brand Burberry, who had only been trading for 10 years at this point in nearby Basingstoke. The mill would produce the silk linings used in Burberry jackets and similar items, and this would continue up until 1955, at which point the mill was taken over by another company. A few more company changes later, by 1990, the mill was in the hands of a preservation trust, and they opened it to the public as a tourist attraction or museum. In 2012, they reintroduced silk manufacturing at the mill using machinery that dates back to 1890. A short distance from Whitchurch is the village of Overton, where we find another historic mill. But until 2022, this mill produced something a little bit more interesting, money. The site at Overton was set up in 1922 by a company called Portals, who had been in the papermaking business since 1712. Overton Mill was an extension of their existing operations in nearby Laverstoke. In simple terms, it was a paper mill, but they produced the paper used as banknotes, as well as a line of security paper products. At the height of its operation, it employed over 300 staff spread across a 30-acre site, and they produced over 14,000 tonnes of banknote paper every year. In 2022, it was announced that Overton Mill would close, bringing an end to over 300 years of paper milling and manufacturing across the two sites at Overton and Laverstoke. I don't know why they closed the mill. Just print yourself some money and keep trading, no? Anyway, our journey continues along the B3400. 
That's it, just follow the road. It hasn't changed at all over the years until you reach the beautiful town of Basingstoke. Which following the second small disagreement of 1939 to 1945 was allocated as a place for severe redevelopment. This isn't quite the same as the new town plan which gave us places like Stevenage and Harlow, but it's not far off. Essentially, certain towns were designated as London overspill towns and they'd be given a chunk of money to redevelop the town as part of a policy designed to relocate residents from London to the surrounding towns, the reason being that London had been bombed to buggery and no one had anywhere to live. In the days of my guidebook and before all of that, Basingstoke was home to 12,000 people, a fairly large town for the time, but it's nothing compared to modern day. Take a look at this map of Basingstoke from 1923 and you'll see that it looks nothing like the Basingstoke that we're familiar with. My guidebook suggests that maybe we'd like to visit Holy Ghost Chapel ruins, so I have. And what we're looking at are the remains of two chapels, the first built in the year 1280 and the second in 1525. The more recent chapel, which is this one, was well known for its elaborate painted glass windows and beautiful building design, which sadly didn't last very long because in the 1540s-ish, chapels across the country were closed because reasons. So the chapel here was left abandoned and fell into a state of disrepair after only 15 years of use. Next up, a very special treat indeed, because we're going back in time with the Basingstoke Milestones Living History Museum. Here, we're able to get a feel of how things might have been in the days of my 1923 Michelin guidebook. Take a look at this. It's a full-size recreation of the late 19th, early 20th century, featuring cobbled streets and period-correct buildings and vehicles, and it's absolutely amazing. A bit like my scripting, because as you look around the museum, you might spot the odd machine or vehicle made by a company called Taskers of Andover. Remember from earlier, the engineering company based in Anna Valley? Well, it gets better because not only did Taskers manufacture vehicles and machinery, they also made things like bridges, such as the 1851-built Ladies' Walk Bridge. Time to head on to our final destination, the town of Farnborough. Once we negotiate Basingstoke's ring road, we're able to pick up the A30 that in places is a dual carriageway, making it far from original, but it does mostly follow the same route as the original road, so that'll do just fine. Farnborough is perhaps best known for its work within the aviation industry, and indeed, the only thing that my guidebook recommends is Army Aviation Ground. I assume it's referring to Farnborough Airfield, which is an airfield, so we won't be going there. Instead, I've come to a country park and new build housing estate on the west side of Farnborough. However, situated here previously was the National Gas Turbine Establishment, an organisation that tested jet engines at a top secret facility known as Pystock. As you'll have seen from the excellent photographs provided by the top secret auto shenanigans urban exploration establishment, thanks Landy Man, it was an extensive industrial site that featured some huge blue tubes. During the testing and development of the early jet engines, you needed a supply of fast moving air. And when I say fast, I mean 2000 miles an hour fast and your ordinary wind tunnel won't cut the mustard. So they constructed a huge air house designed to generate and move air along those massive blue pipes, which would then be used during their testing. To do amazing things requires some fairly amazing machinery and they used eight compressors that, when combined, had a total power output of over 350,000 brake horsepower. And it was combined because they'd run them all at the same time and such was the power draw on the national grid. They had to negotiate special terms with the electricity suppliers and they could only run it overnight when enough electricity was available. And there we are then guys, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is of course a button specifically for that and if you haven't subscribed subscribed already, please consider doing so. That'd be wicked sweet awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting Great British Road Journey. Till then, take care, bye-bye.